What's going on, people? Welcome back to the Opposition Preview. This week, I've got Cole from the Hulk cast to look ahead to the game on the weekend. As always, we want your comments to so leave them down below. Share your thoughts ahead of the game and I'll try to reply back to you all as soon as I can. Um, Cole, thanks for joining me. Um, it's been a turbulent few months for you guys. So, Start off with Greedish leaving, then afterwards you brought in loads of, not loads of new players, you brought in some talented players, which I think personally, and then afterwards you have Dean Smith getting sacked, and now you have Steven Gerrard there. Did you sense anything like this happening a couple of months ago when the season kicked off? Um, Not necessarily. Um, I think it really all kicked off when Jack Grealish left. Um, for many, he was probably the one bullet in Dean Smith's chamber kind of thing, if you want to put it in that sense. Um, and ever since then, we've kind of been playing catch-up. Not a good start to the season. I don't think anyone really had a perfect preseason with the quick turnaround and the amount of injuries and COVID-related stuff and all that kind of thing going on in the whole world. So it's been a very uh, stop and start. We haven't really had uh, many of our star players, I guess you could say now, um, whether it be, through, like I said, COVID or injury, something like that. I think um, our win against Brighton last weekend was the first, or sorry, second uh, time we've only had our official back four that we always played last season actually play together. So it's been very chop and change um, and kind of see how we go. But uh, no, it's been a, it's been an absolute whirlwind and I'm hoping the Steven Gerrard appointment is one that we can at least hold on to for a couple of years and you know what if he does well then uh, i guess liverpool will probably have adam at that point and we'll go through it all again you said it yourself i was going to talk about that how does that feel though as a villa fan you look no manager is permanent in the premier league like we've seen the long-term managers are really not a thing anymore but then you also don't see a manager who comes into the job and before it's all kicked off like it's straight away oh steven gerrard to liverpool steven gerrard to liverpool how does that make you feel as a Villa fan that your current manager is most likely not going to be there once Liverpool get rid of Jurgen Klopp? It's a tricky one because um, if we didn't have Dean Smith as our last manager, I think it might have went down a little bit better with most. I think most people are okay with it, though, that I've spoke to within the Villa fan base, purely on the aspect of, okay, if he does well, then he goes to Liverpool, which means Villa's doing well. So I think that's the one key thing that everyone's taking away from it. And it kind of happens really with any ex-player. Like you look at uh, Lampard eventually going from Derby to Chelsea, of course. Um, Vieira now, of course, doing all at Palace. And I, I think when you guys were playing him, they're already linking him back with Arsenal to replace Arteta. Um, same thing with Arteta, of course, before he went back to Arsenal as well. So... I think it's just one of those things where for the press, it's easy to kind of just grab for. And I mean, it is a little weird from the Liverpool aspect. I mean, when they, when Villa did announce the um, appointment of Steven Gerrard, Liverpool made a literal article on their website about him being appointed as our new boss with like a weird little photo. Like you have a, like a school day where he's like an awkward smile kind of thing. Um, so it's a little odd. I'm, I'm sure when we play Liverpool next month in December, it'll, probably dominate for that week but uh no you know what if he does well then the football club's doing well so i'll have to be happy imagine the team <laughs> the liverpool score a last minute winner you see steven gerrard running down the line to celebrate <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but uh talk, <laughs> just just going over the mute um just talking about your previous manager quickly dean smith um I've seen some Villa fans say that he shouldn't have been sacked. Of course, he's a Villa fan himself, your manager, which we don't really see um, nowadays. With um, You don't really see that, you know, a manager who actually supports the club. What did you make of the decision to get rid of him? Do you think it was the right time for him to leave? Um, well, I, I, I almost like jokingly have to blame Manchester United because our last win uh, under Dean Smith was the 1 0 at Old Trafford. Um, and since then, I think they've been on an absolute calamitous losing streak and have been struggling of course uh ollie's gone as well so no more ollie at the wheel and sorry for many fans i haven't faced united yet you don't maybe get that benefit but aside from that it's That's awesome. five five losses on the bounce um the southampton game um obviously before um, the international break and of course when we changed management um really kind of set it all this the first half was 
just calamitous the way that goal went in. I mean, it was a beautifully struck ball by Armstrong, but there was no cohesiveness. There was no link up play. There was nothing. It was hoof balls. It was a hope and a prayer. Um, and then the one thing that most Villa fans will remember when we had Steve Bruce as manager in the championship, when he was starting to run out ideas, was he was sticking the likes of Christopher Samba up front at striker. To be fair, it worked once, but it doesn't mean you should do it more than once. Um, and you're just you're just throwing as many strikers on the pitch as you can. And I think Dean Smith threw um, Keenan Davis on. I think we still had Ollie Watkins, and um, I don't think we had Ings at that point, but there was another striker I think he threw on at that point too. And at that point, you just know you're clutching at straws, hoping for something to happen. And it's unfortunate because the Villa fan thing, and I don't think I'll ever see a Villa fan as captain and as head coach at the same time ever again. Um, that whole era is now gone. And I think for a lot of people, it's very difficult because – um, and not to ramble on too much, but the relegation that we suffered, I don't know if I've ever seen more a more toxic fan base at that point. It was really bad in some of the championship days initially. Um, and then with the administration stuff coming in with our old ownership under Tony Gia, where he didn't even have the money and basically just gambled it on promotion, which we didn't achieve um, under him. It just... It was all up in the air. Dean Smith comes in, him and Grealish lead, lead us out of the championship. It's a fairy tale story. And just bringing that kind of community feel back to Villa Park in that area, and not even just for local fans, but for fans abroad as well. I've never seen the club more connected and aware of its fan base kind of outside of that as well. So it's going to be interesting to see how they kind of keep that all. But uh, for me, it's important, but we'll have to wait and see. So what about Palace? As a Villa fan, looking at Palace's business so far um, in the summer and also bringing in Patrick Vieira, of course, you guys did beat us with 10 men last season at your ground, which hurt me and still hurts me till this day. Um, what have we made of Palace's business so far? And as a Villa fan, um, what do you think realistically this Palace squad can achieve under Patrick Vieira? You guys have been extremely entertaining. Um, like I said in uh, my podcast that we did right before this one, so cheeky plug there. But nonetheless, um, yeah, I'm very excited for you guys, to be honest. They're one side that I've always had a little bit of an eye on, maybe not watch it, but for the results. Um, and it, it's great to see you guys doing well. It's nice to see teams other than your traditional top six or top eight or whatever it is nowadays. It's nice to see other teams trying stuff, trying to go for those, I guess you could say, hidden gems or your kind of unfamiliar players and trying something new. And I think appointing Vieira was bold, and I think it's paying off, and I think you'll reap the benefits of that reward. Maybe, I guess, probably short-term, because that's management now in football. There's no Vangers or Fergusons anymore. That is probably long gone until maybe another cycle happens in, I don't know, how many years from now. But, uh, no, I, I think the likes of Conor Gallagher um, and like I said, Guy in our, in our uh, podcast that we did earlier as well, um, are two that I look at in particular, and I kind of sit there and think I wouldn't mind them in my side. And I remember saying it to my co-host last season when we, when we were playing uh, West Brom and Connor Gallagher is, I wouldn't say running the show, but he was definitely their best player on the pitch by a country mile. And I was saying I wouldn't mind him in our side at all. And everyone basically dismissed that. And now I'm thinking everyone's probably sitting there wondering, hmm, that would have been a good idea, but uh, no, you guys are doing very well. And I, I think the one thing that helps you guys as well, keeping the likes of Wilfred Zaha, I think that really helps it for one, an excellent player on his day. And two, it's that local community feel as well that he can bring. It's the same thing that I kind of liken to Jack Grealish as well. Um, it It's a representation of the fans on the pitch. And I think that's the most important thing. That's how it was ages and ages ago. It's good to see some of that still kind of exist to an extent. But uh, no, I think you guys will have a good season. I think, if anything, I would probably say upper mid table or maybe even within maybe tenth would be probably the place I would say Palace would finish. Well, what about the likes of Wolf Bizarre, Mark Way, um, Connor Gallagher? Who worries you the most going into this game? Ooh, probably Connor Gallagher, I would say. Um, definitely runs your midfield. Um, that's evident to see. He's not afraid to take people on, and I think that's the one thing that a lot of defenders aren't comfortable with. The biggest thing for Villa kind of tactically right now that we've quickly noticed under Steven Gerrard is he likes to keep his high press going with 
the 4-3-3. So you're constantly going to have wingers and your striker pressing the back line, but he likes to keep the midfield very tight as well um, to the front three too. So it's going to be interesting to see how often the likes of Gallagher and Zaha can, of course, kind of get in behind and kind of create that space. Um, for me, if anything, the one thing I look at is how you guys are going to probably operate around our left flank. Maddie Target hasn't had a good season. Uh, the Brighton game was his best game by far, and that was kind of the old Matty target. So it'll be interesting to see, for one, if he starts there, and two, how you guys can kind of exploit that for me. Well, I'll be honest with you. It's not just the Matty target. I'm worried about other players. So, of course, I haven't watched Villa in depth so far this season. And also, it's kind of hard to judge players in a team that wasn't doing too well under the current manager. It seemed like Dean Smith was kind of lost with his tactics. And, of course, the players... What can you expect from them so far this season? But when you look at some individual names there, you got uh, Brian Dia, you got um, Danny Yings, you got Ollie Watkins, you got John McGinn. As a Villa fan, who are you picking out that we should watch out for going into this game? Because there are some talented balls there. Um, you know what? If I run through the team really quickly, um, posi not position by position, but kind of section by section, of course, Emmy Martinez is, in my opinion, one of the best goalkeepers in the league. How the hell Arsenal let him go and let him? I, I just it, it stumble. Like I, I don't really. It doesn't make any sense to me. But slightly um, with Ramsdale, they you know they they're happy with him. But yeah, I, I, I feel like he's definitely. slightly overrated still. But that's to be Ooh. determined. Um, <laughs> I don't know. It, it's one of those things where uh, a keeper comes in or a player comes in in early days and he has a few good games and then you think he's the messiah. I mean, we kind of thought that about Emmy last season as well and. He's backed it up. Maybe Ramsdale will, but that's an Arsenal debate we don't need to have. Um, and of course, defensively, you're probably going to look at Matty Cash on the right. He would definitely be one. He loves to bomb forward, but he's also very responsible in his own zone as well. So that shouldn't be too much of an issue for us. Midfield, it's honestly, um, I wouldn't say too much of a chop and change. It kind of depends if Douglas Louise will be fit, but you'd probably have to say John McGinn's the one. Um, just incredible how much he's kind of get, regained fitness he hasn't really been himself since he got injured in the 1920 season when we came back up but he seems to be um the same kind of have the same form of his championship days and he looks even fitter than he did bef then um so that's really good to see it lo looks like he's kind of laid off the iron brew a little bit so if i don't know if you've ever seen that he has he has a photo and i think one of our games and he's holding it up in celebration or something like that so uh with gerard getting rid of i think ketchup and all those kind of condiments now at the, the training ground i'm sure <laughs> yeah is he doing that as well I've, i heard about it's not gerard who was it it was um what's the name conte at tottenham yes is it What's going on? What, what's up with these? What's the theory behind it? What you can't just have ketchup? What does ketchup <laughs> no, do? Just no more trans fats, I guess. <laughs> like, what, what, what does a ketchup do that damages a player so badly that it's banned everywhere? Is there? Do you know about it? Like, is there actual logic behind it? Have you read about it? <laughs> no, I'm not really too sure to be honest. I feel like it's just more of a. Well, I'm sure they have dietitians and health oh, science oh. individuals that are all into ketchup. that kind of stuff, but. Uh, I, I don't know. I, I don't really see how a little squirt of, unless you're like drinking the ketchup or something, yeah. I could see <laughs> exactly. an issue just with it. Whole bottle. <laughs> but uh, yeah, that'll be an interesting one. And then just to finish up, I would probably say going forward right now would probably be Ollie Watkins. I think he's finally starting to get some of that form from last season. I would say Danny Ings, but to be honest, I feel like we kind of bought him when we didn't really know how we would fit him and Watkins together. Um, and we're still figuring that out, but yeah, I would have to say Watkins up front. So, in terms of tactics, uh, I don't want to talk about this, but the Burnley game, um, we struggled with set pieces and long ball, and we talked about it on your podcast as well. Spoiler alert. Um, <laughs> hopefully, you to let the viewers know, you guys don't play like Burnley, do you? No, no. Um, to Thank be fair you. to Burnley, though, I mean, we we dissed them quite a bit on on our, our uh, recording of my podcast. To be Don't get me wrong, if there's if there's any Burnley fans watching, it works. But you might say I'm salty. You might say whatever. I'm I'm not gonna you know deny it. But it was very frustrating for just balls over the top. Something so simple. And you know we've had that before at Palace, and I know how other teams felt. But something so simple that affected us is is actually tra traumatized me. I just, any team that plays balls over the top, I'm I'm worried. I don't care who it is, how many points they've got, because we were that bad. And, um, of course, we have time to work on it now. But 
as long as Villa don't play like that, then I've got a bit more optimism going into this game. And I think Palace fans will agree with me. <laughs> yeah, no, um, I wouldn't say that's definitely our strong point. Um, and like I was going to say before, to be fair to Burnley, I mean, I feel like Cornet's kind of reinvigorated that side yeah. completely from nowhere and has them playing a little bit better. Interesting to see how one player can do that. But no, I, I would say if anything from that kind of standpoint it would probably be from set pieces or from corners. Um, still to be determined if we can be better at those. But this season thus far, I, I can think of a few. Um, the overhead kick from Danny Ings against Newcastle. Um, which I mean, those are one in a million, it feels like. And then, um, of course, the uh, Courtney Hawes winner against United, of course, came from a, a set piece as well. So we can be physical in the air, but it's all b about that initial delivery. And as long as I've been a Villa fan, initial delivery has always been an issue. Well, you're playing Palace. And the Burnley fan that I spoke to as well, he told me before um, we faced them, apparently, you know, they're not actually, they're not very good in the air or they don't score goals from set pieces. And then what happens is they play Palace and they score two from set pieces. So just don't worry about your delivery. When it comes to Palace, trust me, team just switch up. They will turn and them balls will be crispy. It'll be like prime Ronaldinho balls into the box and prime Roberto Carlos as well. So don't worry about that. So hopefully that doesn't happen. But, you know, when teams do say we're not good at this and that, I'm like, all right, let's just see when you face Palace, yeah? Because <laughs> teams just love to switch it up. But um, Cole... Let's end up with this score predictions. Um, I was going to ask you about the lineups, but it might be a bit difficult because you just got a new manager in, and that would be a bit harsh on you to go predict the lineup because he might change it about, and you've only had one game. But how do you see this one going? You want you beat Brighton as Palace fans, we say thank you. Um, but <laughs> against Crystal Palace now, are you hoping for? Well, are you expecting another win, or would you be happy with a draw? Um, just to kind of touch on, I won't really bring up the lineup but the one thing i will say is expect a lot of like i said before a lot of forward pressing um mm. and a lot more kind of one-on-one -on -one in terms of uh coverage um at, at least an open play i would say um that's the one thing i've instantly noticed so far under gerard there's a real essence to get the ball back and to i wouldn't necessarily keep it but to move it around on the pitch and kind of get it moving around that way um I do expect to win and mainly maybe that's probably because I feel like we need it at this point going into Man City. Um, I think we have Liverpool as well um, in December and there's Norwich who are suddenly dead and buried and now are playing well, which is always great for other teams. Um, you almost wish you played them when they're in their poor run. So there's a few uh, games in there. I'm not really sure how they're going to go. So this is one that I always kind of look at and think we have to. And for us as well it's a measuring stick because you can beat your cities on a one-off or your chelsea's or whatever but if you can't beat the teams that technically should probably be in around you most of the time then where are you really at i mean even i, I even in the past i'm thinking of norwich going down and beating i think city in, in united or something in the same season yeah, yeah, yeah. it really doesn't mean much <laughs> it's the teams in or around you but no i'm gonna go for a uh a 2-1 villa victory and uh if that happens, I hope it's uh, an early goal followed up by a late winner so I don't have to stress about it too much. Oh, don't do that. <laughs> I just can't deal with late. Bernie need to beat us late, man, as well. So I don't want to deal with any late goals. If you're going to beat us, just let it be early. Uh, like Leicester, well, Leicester didn't beat us, but they scored two early goals and we managed to come back. But for my score prediction, I'm going to go for a 2-1 Palace win. Um, the only reason is because of the way that you guys play. Um, so far this season, we've Managed to deal well with the press and dealing with teams playing on the floor. Before that game against City and Wolves, who played on the floor as well, we managed to keep, you know, two clean sheets and it's 2-0 wins. So I think it's going to still be a difficult game, don't get me wrong, but I'm going to go for a 2-1 Palace. We're still unbeaten at home. And as you've said, if we beat the likes of City, but then, you know, struggle against Burnley and then against you guys, which um, I don't mean that with any disrespect, but, you know, we should be, both teams should be aiming to win. Just like I talked to the Burnley fan last week, you know, we both should be aiming to win as clubs. So I'm going to go for 2 on Palace win. A um, bit more positive after hearing what you've said. Uh, but before you do go, Cole, where can they find you and all your work? Yeah, of course. Um, if you want to listen to a Canadian Villa fan, um, it's at Talk Aston Villa on Twitter. Very simple. Glad I got that handle way, way back in the day, to be honest. Um, of course, if you want to read anything Villa related, it's at 75 Holt. And if you feel like listening to a podcast or one where me and D are speaking, of course, you can search Holtcast wherever you get your pods. Okay.
Uh, so I'm gonna go, make sure to go check out um, Cole's work. I, I was on there talking about the Pies perspective. Um, interesting chat because both clubs got new managers, new players as well. So it should be an exciting game. I expect it to be a bit more... Um, I don't know. Burnley game was end to end, so it can't be more end to end than Burnley because that would be actually scary. But expect it to be a tight contested game between you know both both sides got talented players. So let's see how that works out. But thank you to every single one of you who have watched this. As always, leave down your comments down below, and I'll try to reply back to you guys as soon as possible. And also your score predictions as well. And until next time, up the palace. <laughs>